Kumara, yes. You, you can apply this to any species in Africa? Yes. So you can, the question is, can we apply these models to any species? And the answer to that is yes. But the reason the answer is yes is because these models are in computers and we can do anything we want in a computer. Um, the real question is, do we give credibility to these models uh, for all kinds of species? And for me personally, I, I think there are different ways that I would interpret these models for plants or for large mammals or birds that can move around. And we can talk more about how we do that. This, we're just trying to do sort of a cartoon of, of how species might move and, and think about. But again, the models aren't to tell us exactly where the species is going to be in the future. Models are there to help us, give us one tool that helps us think about how species might be affected. But that doesn't mean we should just turn off our brains and not think about how species would be affected. If, uh, if we're in, a, in Bale Mountain and there are springs that wildlife use, and we think that those springs may disappear due to climate change, we should not just look at this model because this model doesn't include springs at all. So, you know, we can use this model to tell us part of the story about what might be happening in that area. But if there are these other things going on, it's much more important to recognize what the local context is and, and respond. So, um, I think these models aren't an exclusive tool. If you find people using them, hopefully, generally, it means they're thinking about climate change, which is a good thing, but we don't want to only think about climate change through these models. We want to take a broader view. And that, okay, so that brings us to our challenge. So now we're going to be transplanted to the Cedarburg Wilderness Area, that, that mount, montane plateau that I pointed out on the satellite image, and we're going to be charged with becoming the reserve managers in, in this area. And it's a montane area and the government of South Africa is concerned that climate change is affecting us. South Africa was recently in, invaded by Bilalia. Bilalia is a very progressive country and uh, is very concerned about climate change and has tasked us to go to the Cedarburg and figure out what the proper responses to, to climate change might be in this uh, protected area. So let's go, I don't think I have anything else here. Okay, this just shows present and future side by side and the rest is, is not for us right now. So let's go to the Cedarburg. Here, here's your new employer, Cape Nature Conservation, now called Cape Nature. Uh, you're gonna work for Cape Nature. Uh, you're gonna be assigned to the Cedarburg. Uh, the Cedarburg is about 60,000 hectares, I think. Um, and so you've got a big protected area to deal with. Uh, you're, you're relieved though when you get there because you look around the Cedarburg and population density is very low. Uh, it's nothing like where we just came from this morning. Uh, we don't have agricultural land up to the border of the reserve. Uh, we have low intensity agriculture and grazing outside of the reserve. And the reserve is montane, very poor soils. Uh, there has never been a lot of agriculture in this area uh, in the past, probably grazing. I uh, don't know the full history of the area. That's one of the things, of course, as we're assigned there, we'll have to learn. But for the moment, we just want to get an overview of our new assignment and figure out what the impacts of climate change might be. So let's look at just a couple of photos of the area. So as I mentioned, it, it, the Cedarburg starts at the edge of the coastal lowland, goes up an escarpment into this high montane area, very sparse tree, growth form vegetation, uh, but a lot of grasses and fanbos, the proteas and ericas that we're interested in conserving. A um, few large mammals in this area. There's some small antelope, um, but if we want to think about what our conservation focal species are, they're probably plants, uh, because this is the fanbos. It's one of the uh, world's uh, floristic kingdom kingdoms uh, in an area that's tiny compared to the other floristic kingdoms on the planet. So we're, we're concerned about plants in these areas, and I guess this isn't going to change automatically. And these proteas are one of the plants we're concerned about. So we have the good fortune of bumping into some researchers at the South African National Biodiversity Institute who've been doing models of proteas uh, using the Protea Atlas and they can show us some of the 
projected some of the modeled responses of species, proteus species to climate change. And we can ask ourselves uh, what that might mean for how we manage our reserve and uh, how we look at the reserve in context. Uh, in case you're interested, adults are going to pay about 60 rand, about 10 US dollars to get into this reserve. Uh, half that price for kids. Uh, if you want to come in and use their uh, sort of uh, lodging facilities, you're going to pay about $100 a night. Um, group camping, much less expensive. So you've got tourists coming in. You've got um, plant habitats. You may be worried about managing your tourism. There's a road that does go through the middle of the reserve, uh, but there aren't, there's no habitation along that road and uh, not a lot of threats building out. There's not fuel wood collection or things going from that. So you've got some tourists on your hands. You've got plants and you've got climate change is a new thing. You, you know, you've had a reserve that's been sort of luckily uh, not beset by a lot of issues, but you're quite concerned about climate change and what it may do to especially to the flora, Emily, of your <laughs> reserve and, uh, and how you might manage that. So let's now go take a look at some other models. If I can get this to open up nicely. Oh, sorry. Yes, we're doing tabs. I know that. It's all good. Okay, so here's <coughs> a different view of the world. So I have to explain this map. Okay, again, you can see it's kind of chopped up in squares. It's a raster model. The ocean is out here in blue. And remember I mentioned the Karoo vegetation? Well, it's here in blue. I'm sorry, somebody did this for me years ago. I should have had them do this in brown because it now looks like the ocean is about to close in on the Cape. But this is not ocean up here. What? Sea level rise. Sea level rise. This is not ocean. This is another vegetation type. But the vegetation type, the Fainbos, that makes the Cape so unique is what's here in gray and white. Uh, it, indeed, the ocean is out here. If I can navigate around a little bit, I'll show you where Cape Town is. Okay, so here, I can get rid of the northern ocean. That makes it easier. So here's the ocean. Here's Cape Agullis. Uh, here's Cape Point. Here's Table Mountain National Park that we talked about. And in this map, <coughs> the light green areas, the light green areas are the existing protected areas. The dark green means something else, and we'll discuss that next time. But here, the light green areas are the existing protected areas. Here's the Kogelberg. Here's Cape Point National Park. Here's Table Mountain National Park. And if we go up the coast, if you drive up the coast about five hours, you get to Clan William, which is a little town here. And you take a road over, and you get to the Cedarburg, which is the protected area that we're charged with figuring out what might happen with climate change. Um, I don't know if you can see it very well here, but the other color going on here, can, can you see the light gray here? Okay, so the light gray indicates the areas that are in agriculture. So that's agricultural areas. So you can see the land use here a little bit. You see there's hardly any gray around the Cedarburg, which means you have mostly natural vegetation, grazing, you know, human land uses, privately owned land around the reserve, but not a lot of sort of crop, row crop agriculture around the reserve. Whereas in some of these other areas, you do have um, agriculture and we'll see, we're going to put some species models on here and we'll see that the species models are allowed to occupy the white areas, the natural vegetation, but they, they can't pass through the agricultural lands. Okay, any questions about where we are or what we're managing? Okay, so now we're going to throw some species models in here. And as I mentioned, they're not just going to be present and future, they're going to be five decadal time steps up to the future. Yeah, question? Uh, nowadays, uh, areas for conservation are restricted. The rest areas are occupied by agriculture or settlement, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So if uh, the, but the, this model tells us through environmental change, uh, species will shift. So what 
will be, that means it indicates that the species will be Right, so species will be changing due to climate change, but as we saw in the wine example, agriculture and human land uses will be changing with climate change as well. Um, as my father always used to say when I asked too much for Christmas, he said, well, if you had everything, where would you put it? So this is, we, if we were doing the absolute perfect model of, of climate change and conservation planning for the future, we would have changes in human land use in this model as well, but we do not. All we have, and so that's just our, our friends who are the researchers in, at uh, Sanby, at the Biodiversity Institute, you know, just didn't have a land use model because it'd be very complex to understand how people and crops are gonna respond to climate change. They, they didn't have that model, so all their, that gray area is gonna stay in the same place. And that's not realistic. In the real world, that gray area would be moving with climate change and human development, but for our purposes, we're, we just stuck with land use as, as it is. And that, in a way, that's not terrible because if what we wanna do is sort of plan to see if there's any additional protection or what things we could do right now to help species in the future, we're concerned about current land use because you know these white areas are natural, so if we wanted to annex a little piece onto the Cedarburg somewhere, we could do that now. Uh, in the future, we gotta be concerned about what pressures we may be facing or what climate change might be bringing to us. But for right now, we could say, okay, th this just shows us where we have opportunities with existing natural habitat. Okay, now I have to find a species for us to look at. And so we're gonna start with one. Okay, so remember, these are time steps. Unfortunately, I can't stop it. So it's just gonna repeat over and over again. And where it is, the present version of this is right here. This broadest extent is the present and then the species is slowly shrinking. Okay, and that's the general pattern here. Now, not all species, and we'll look at this, not all species shrink in response to climate change, but we do have this situation here where we expect species to be moving upslope and south, and there's nowhere south to go to, really. So we're gonna be seeing species losing range here and moving up into the Cape Fold Mountains here are the Cape Fold Mountains, they, they define this boundary, and we see these species moving up into the higher peaks in the Cape Fold Mountains, okay? So here's one species that's doing that. Everybody okay? They can see where it starts in the present and then sort of shrinks into the future. So that's, that's gonna be the pattern of what we'll see here. We get these five time steps that goes jump, 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 and then it starts over and, and goes again. And I'll just leave those up and we can talk about them. You sort of have to use your imagination to figure out where the present is and how it's moving into the future. But uh, if you have questions about that, let me know. So does everybody see how, at least for this species, the change is working into the future? What's the time interval? Yeah, so it's 10 year time intervals. So in this, when we get to this one, this is the, the current, and then it's every 10 years to 2050. Okay, and that doesn't matter so much for us right now because we're just doing this for illustrative purposes. We could do it in 20 year time steps to the end of the century. We could do it in 10 year time steps for 100 years. Lots of different ways we could do it, but this is, it's taking us to mid-century. Uh, I guess one important thing to note about that is that it's not the end of the century, so there might be more sort of shrinkage of the species range past 2050, because even though it sounds like they're making some good progress in Paris right now, uh, they're not gonna get climate change completely under control to the point that it's not happening in 2050. Climate change will still be happening in 2050, so we may see further change than this. And so that's a good question. You know, if your, your Sandby collaborator is presenting you this model, you might, you want to know, you know, is this 2050? Is, or is it going to continue to change or is this 2080? And maybe if we're really lucky, there won't be any additional change. Well, this is 2050. There may be additional change, but for our purposes, we can just take it for what it is. Yeah, Ben, what else? Ben? Existing protected areas. 
So I think that's good for the expected bird species. Except that few of the protected areas, boundaries, maybe you see a low population outside the boundaries of the uh, At least a good percentage would be within protected areas. Okay, okay. I think I got it. Sorry, the air conditioning, a little hard to hear. But so, to repeat the question, uh, and Ben, just correct me if you're wrong, but I think you're saying up until 2050, this species, so this is just one species, and we're going to look at several species, but this one species seems to exist in protected areas pretty well up till 2050. Is that what you're saying? Right. Okay, so that's right. And what about the protected area that you're in? Anybody else want to tackle this one? What's happening with this particular species in the Cedarburg? You're not allowed to answer, Ben. <laughs> You're doing too much. Anybody, Kate? Was that something? Uh, this isn't a trick question. I mean, what do you see happening with this? What's, so think of the, the yellow as the species range, right? And so often we think about a species range as being sort of something that's fixed. Uh, but what we're seeing now that is that as climate changes, species ranges are going to change. And so we need to think about how that change interacts with our reserve boundaries and our conservation efforts. Um, so just what do you see happening with this species range? In, just just assume this model is right, you know, let's suspend disbelief and we'll just say we accept whatever this model is telling us. What, what are we seeing happening with the species range in, in the Cedarburg? Do we remember where this, you know, this is the Cedarburg right up here, this light green area, right? So just what's, what pops out at you? Yes? Yes. Decreasing from time to time. Yeah, so it's decreasing as we go through the time steps of the future. Did you have one too, Michael? Yeah, I just wanted to add that um, you have a situation where population will occur in pockets. In focal areas? In, in pockets. Oh, in pockets. Yeah, yeah. Continue. Yeah, yeah. We'll see some of that. So, so uh, yes. Generally, what we're seeing with this species, so um, I hope the mic was picking it up. But uh, we, we were just saying that the species is decreasing through time within the Cedarburg. So we start in the present. I don't know this particular species in the Cedarburg, but according to the model, if we believe the model, the species is all over the Cedarburg right now. And by the time you get to 2050, it's down to maybe 10 or 20 percent of the Cedarburg. And that makes some sense because the Cedarburg has elevation. It's generally a plateau, but it certainly has topography. So there are higher and lower parts. And if this species is being forced upslope, it may wind up in some of the higher areas of the Cedarburg. Um, OK, that's fine. And as Ben noted, in other parts of the species range, we're seeing it moving upslope, but many of the protected areas are in, in the mountains. So the species seems to be moving into places where there is protection, or more importantly, staying in places where there's protection. So let's look at another species and see what that looks like. So I've got a few picked out for you. I'll show you what this looks like as I switch back and forth. But here's the entire list of species. So Sandby has modeled over 300 species for us, and we can pick any of them to look at. So we could just go through and have you guys <laughs> call out a species if you can see it at, at this uh, small size. But um, because some of them have sort of interesting patterns, I've pre-selected a few. So let's do some of those first, and then we can try some just on your selection if, if you'd like. Okay, well, here's a species that's doing something, but it's sure not doing it in the Cedarburg, so we don't need to look at that. So if you look, if we scroll down, this is a species that exists. Sorry, I'm forgetting which species are which. This one exists in the Agullis Plain. The reason I usually show this to people is because if you look at this pattern, it's kind of interesting. While we say that we expect things to be moving south here, this species actually moves north, or looks to move north, as it moves into some upper elevation places behind the Agullis Plain. So this is a low-lying plain along the coast, and uh, there's a, a row of hills that backs the area, and these species are just finding refuge in the upper elevation parts ab above the hills. But 
it doesn't exist in the Cedarburg now, and it's not projected to, to uh, exist there in the future, so we don't need to worry about that one. Um, so let's look at, it's like an eye test here. And sometimes, and the names aren't all in order, they repeat. So I may have to uh, skip that one and go to LD floor if I can find it. Um, sorry, I usually have these pre selected so that they're jumping out at me and they're not. No. Well, let's, since I'm not seeing those, okay, that one doesn't go in the Cedarburg. Just see if we can find one. Okay, so here's another one that exists in the Cedarburg. Let's see if, okay, yeah. Now, so what do we see in this this pattern for this species in the Cedarburg? Emily, anybody? 